legislators and leadership, especially my good friend, colleague for many years, our and your new speaker, Mike Moyle. I know that working together with Speaker Moyle, Pro Tem Chuck Winder, and all of you, my legislative partners, we will do more historic things for the state of Idaho. We also have some new constitutional officers. Superintendent of Public Instruction Debbie Critchfield and her husband Dave, Attorney General Raul Labrador and his wife Becca, Secretary of State Phil McGrain and his wife Angela, and of course, our new Lieutenant Governor Scott Bedke and his wife, Sarah. <laughs> Scott, I'm reassured knowing that any time I leave the state for the next four years, the most unexpected thing you'll do is give a riveting speech on water adjudication. <laughs> Please join me again in, in congratulating them and everyone who earned the confidence of voters this last November. I also want to acknowledge the person in my life who grounds me and reinforces family values every day, our First Lady Teresa. Besides always giving a better speech than I do, <laughs> you've always prioritized the things that matter most, and thank you, and I love you very much. <laughs> to the people of Idaho, I'm so humbled and grateful that you trusted me to be your governor for the next four years. It's been the greatest honor of my life to serve and help chart a, score, uh, chart a course for our great state. Thank you. <laughs> After any election, the political wonks, including myself, dive deep into the results. And one th thing on the ballot that was more popular than any contested race, what was it? It was the people's vote on education and tax relief. 80%, four out of five voters, approve of what we achieved in the 2022 Extraordinary Session last September. We recognize the financial emergency existing and facing our Idaho families and schools as they grapple with the impacts of 40-year high inflation. We used our projected budget surplus to provide every Idahoan with immediate tax rebate and passed a new flat income tax so Idahoans can keep more of their hard-earned money moving forward. We also put the single largest ongoing investment ever into Idaho education, $330 million for public schools and $80 million for in-demand career training. The people's vote affirming tax relief and our education investments passed in every single county, every single city, and every single legislative district. The overwhelming support of our plan means unmistakably. Idahoans expect us to support public schools. <laughs> Idahoans spoke loud and clear with their votes. And I will sheepishly admit, I did check the ballot results in Emmett, would you believe that funding education and cutting taxes was more popular than their hometown governor? <laughs> Go figure. It's one of those healthy reminders that what we do here is far more important than any one of us. And the work we do will outlive all of us. Let's focus on the big things. Let's spend our time and energy to improve the lives of Idahoans for generations to come. With the winds at our back, and a strong mandate from every corner of Idaho, let's work together to translate the people's vote into action by making, dare I say, historic investments in education a reality.
Here's what else I took from the election. Idaho, Idahoans like being first in economic momentum, revenue growth, job growth, responsible government, and cutting red tape. Idahoans like being a top 10 state for economic outlook and strong fiscal policy. Idahoans like a flourishing economy, historic tax rec relief, and record education investments. Plain and simple, the people of Idaho have given us a mandate to stay on course, put Idaho for first, continue the path of prosperity, and keep investing in education. To the people of Idaho, we are listening and we will continue to deliver. We are not backing down on education, we are doubling down on education. The budget and policy recommendations I'm mapping out today deliver on that mandate given to us by the people of Idaho. My plan, called Idaho First, the first in the plan is education. Four years ago, I started I stated my goal is to make Idaho a place where we all can thrive and where our children and grandchildren choose to stay and for those that left, choose to return. Expanding economic opportunities are providing jobs for our kids. And now we need to foster better jobs and higher incomes and a better quality of life that we can all be proud of. I'm a businessman and a family man and I look at every issue through the lens of what our businesses and our families need to prosper. We all benefit from a strong economy, one where businesses can offer rewarding careers and opportunities that lead to strong families and strong communities. As I travel the state and listen to employers about their challenges, workforce always tops the list. We've made huge progress in connecting employers with resources to train employees. And my Idaho First Plan gets even more skilled workers through their doors. I'm very proud to announce my budget provides access to a scholarship of $8,500 starting next year to every graduating Idaho student in Idaho to attend an Idaho university, community college, career technical or workforce training program of their choice. Never we provided a catalyst of this magnitude for students to go on in whatever way suits them. There are many pathways to success in Idaho's economy, and all pathways deserve our support. For some students, it means getting their CDL becoming an lineman or pursuing welding. For others, it's engineering, teaching, healthcare, or business. No matter what path a student chooses, we are making it easier for them to get the advanced training they need to propel themselves and Idaho's economy forward. The Idaho Launch Scholarship will be the single largest investment in career technical and workforce education in state history. We want Idaho students brought up in Idaho schools, working at Idaho jobs. This past fall, the student body presidents of, at College of Western Idaho, Boise State University, Lewis Clark State College, and the University of Idaho wrote an article on the need to invest directly in our students and our, work, our future workforce. The students, Adam Jones from Emmett, Tanner McLean from Middleton, and Caden Massey from Kamii, and Flora Koning from Boise said, quote, now more than ever we can't afford for our students to leave Idaho. A statewide scholarship program will not only benefit Idaho students, but will help keep our economy growing and competitive for the next generation. It is time to keep Idaho's future in Idaho. I don't know about you, but I think these students nailed it. We have them with us here today. Adam, Tanner, Caden, and Flora, please stand up so we can recognize them.
person's foundation for success starts very young, and it starts in the home. Education of our children will always rest first and foremost with the family. Schools are partners with parents, and that is why we are making historic investments in both families and schools. Where parents are heavily involved in their child's school and education, we see better academic performance. In fact, Idaho's first in the nation for overall return on investment for education spending, which speaks to the dedication of Idaho families to prepare their children for productive learning every single day. We're also third in the nation for education freedom. Measures that include spending, school choice, transparency, and regulations. Whether it's your traditional public school, public charter schools, public magnet schools, private schools, online academy, academies, or homeschooling. Hundreds of schooling options are available to Idaho families. In fact, Idaho is one of only a handful of states with the fewest restrictions on allowing parents to send their child to any public school they wish. And we are a top 10 state for the number of students enrolled in public charter schools. To further reinforce parents' role as the primary decision makers in their children's education, my Idaho First Plan makes permanent the Empowering Parents Grant Program. The grants help families take charge of tools their, for their children's education. Things like computers, software, instructional materials, and tutoring. These resources help children progress outside of the classroom. To date, we've served tens of thousands of students with these grants. The Empowering Parents, the Empowering Parents grants are effective and popular and worthy of a continued investment. Most importantly, it keeps parents where they should be in the driver's seat of their children's education. The Idaho Constitution recognizes the endurance of our Republican form of government depends upon an educated, intelligent people. The founders spelled out the duty to, quote, establish and maintain a general, uniform, and thorough system of public, free, common schools. As elected leaders, we promise to uphold this contract with the people when we take the oath of office. Our commitment to public schools is both our constitutional obligation and it's our moral obligation. My Idaho First Plan delivers on both the constitutional mandate and the mandate from the voters of Idaho by investing in our public schools. Here with us today, we have some fourth graders and fifth graders from Centennial Elementary School in Nampa and their teacher, Jamie Hazing. Kids, please wave at us. Thank you for being here. What better way to strengthen our schools than to invest in the people on the front lines of education, our teachers? I want our students here today to clap twice if you agree with what I'm saying. <laughs> students, are you ready? Recess is the best part of the day. <laughs> students, clap twice if you agree. <laughs> Just getting warmed up. Okay, here we go. Teachers get to work early so they can be prepared when their students arrive. Students, clap twice if you agree. Teachers are adapting all day long to a variety of learning styles and individual needs. Clap twice if you agree. <laughs> Teachers spend their evenings and weekends grading papers and relying on parents and students. Clap twice if you agree. <laughs> Best of all, teachers are passionate about preparing students for eventual careers and making them feel safe and supported. Clap twice if you agree. <laughs> Great job, you guys. and there might be an opportunity to you to participate also. <laughs> Our students and their families deserve quality teachers who are respected and compensated competitively. 
Great teachers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Great teachers can motivate and change the trajectory of a student's life. That's why my plan boosts starting teacher pay yet again, finally targeting Idaho in the top 10 state for starting teacher pay. When I started this job four years ago, Idaho was 41st in the country for starting teacher pay. In four short years, we will have catapulted starting teacher pay in Idaho from the bottom 10 to the top 10. We are also going to grow the salaries of all teachers, including the most experienced ones, to ensure students have classrooms, the classroom support they need. What does this mean for the average teacher? It means a $6,300 pay raise. When we show teachers we support them, we're showing families their child education is our priority. I'm also proud that we've made great advances in my top education priority over the last four years, literacy. Learning to read from a young age is the best foundation for learning later on. and makes our investments worthwhile. Since I took office, we have increased literacy funding five-fold. Local school districts determine how best to deploy the resources. Everything from expanding kindergarten, reading coaches, reduced class sizes, or summer reading programs. This past fall, reading scores for all kindergarten through third grade teachers are the highest in years with impressive gains among our youngest learners. The scores are steadily increasing. And while we have more work to do, the results are encouraging. They show we are headed in the right direction. We must continue to prepare our younger generation with the education skills and lifelong passion for learning. That's why we're putting Idaho first and education first. You know, most people want the same things. Health, safety, high quality of life, freedom to choose their own path, strong schools, an abundance of rewarding, reliable career opportunities, and to keep more of their hard-earned money. Our ability to deliver on these things, or at least not stand in the way of them happening, determines our fate. We've all seen states that continually fail, and as a result, people don't want to live there. In fact, I've heard some suggest that California Governor Gavin Newsom is really Idaho's Realtor of the Year. Clap twice if you agree. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> but, but in Idaho, we're striking the right balance between investing in cr key critical areas like our schools and giving more of Idahoans, giving back more of Idahoans' money. In just three years, we've given back more than ever before in Idaho history, a whopping $2.7 billion to Idaho citizens and businesses. No other state in the country has given more tax relief per capita than Idaho. And we're not done yet. We deployed $2.7 in immediate tax relief in four ways. Slashing payroll taxes for small businesses, increasing the grocery tax credit, giving Idahoans the largest ever reimbursement of their property taxes in 2020, and of course, back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back income tax rebates and back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back tax cuts for both personal income and corporate income tax. The tax rebates help thousands of small businesses across our state, as well as senior citizens on fixed income, providing relief from crushing inflation where everything from food to fuel was skyrocketing. Our commitment to cutting taxes doesn't just start and end with one-time relief. We also cut back Idahoans' ongoing tax burden by more than $650 million. We took the income tax from six brackets down to one and created a fair, predictable, and lower flat income tax once and for all.
Folks, what we're doing is working. Consider this the tax foundation ranks states on their business tax climate. It's a useful barometer of a state's competitiveness to attract and retain businesses. In just four years, we've risen six spots, and that's even before accounting for the income tax reduction we adopted in last year's special session. Cutting taxes keeps our business climate competitive, allows Idahoans to keep more of what they earn, and it is just the right thing to do. One area where we really shine may surprise you. The Tax Foundation ranks Idaho as having the third lowest property taxes in the country. So why does that feel surprising to so many? When your property tax bill arrives, you see it all at once. It's not hidden in each paycheck. It's not pennies on the dollar on every purchase you make. You get a bill for the full amount, and I understand why many Idahoans struggling under the weight of record inflation get sticker shock when the bill from local government arrives. The reality is no property taxes are paid to state government. No state official in this room can decide what local property taxes will be. Local governments alone set their budgets. However, some of the parameters around local property taxes are set in state law like the circuit breaker. So people, in, people turn to state leaders in this room for answers. Idahoans want relief from rising property taxes, and we hear them. My Idaho First plan puts another $120 million towards property tax relief to answer the call for help from Idahoans. There, there, there is no doubt Idaho's tremendous, pace of Idaho's tremendous rate, pace of growth is putting a strain on services at the local level, which increases the potential to drive up your local property taxes. But too often, we are simply shifting burdens across taxpayers. We should be addressing the needs head on. Let's work on better ways to facilitate growth, paying for growth, and give local governments the tools they need to keep taxes low. How? By continuing to make long-range strategic investments in roads, water, and other key areas to maintain our high quality of life. The fact is, investing in local infrastructure is property tax relief. Over the past two years, we've made the biggest investments ever in our most precious resource, water. When we're investing in drinking water and wastewater infrastructure, we saved Idaho citizens and local taxes or fees, what they would otherwise pay in property taxes to cover those improvements. Now I'm proposing more investments in water quantity and water quality infrastructure, not only to reduce the burden on local property taxes, but also to secure abundant clean water for the years to come. Investing in local roads and bridges is property tax relief. Last year, we put nearly half a billion into local roads, bridges, and airports. We took a major bite out of the backlog of deficient bridges that local governments have been struggling for years to repair. And we did it without raising taxes or fees. That buys us not just property tax relief, but safer roads, less drive time, and less congestion. Now I'm proposing even more for local bridges and new ongoing funding for transportation safety and capacity to build on our success. We will continue to keep uh, taxes low, but we must do responsibly. We all see the flashing red lights in the economy. Simply put, Washington, D.C. is driving America towards an economic cliff and seemingly pushing down on the gas. Perhaps never has Lieutenant Governor Bedke's grandfather's word rung true. Quote, it won't be the bad years that put you out of business. It's what you do in the good years that sets you up for either failure or success. We must be prudent. We must prepare for the impending economic downturn. And now, more than ever, we must make wise decisions that stand the test of time. 
We can't cut beyond the level of services Idahoans demand, and we must not use our one-time surplus for wasteful spending. Given the economic volatility on the near horizon, this may be our one last shot in the near future to make significant tax cuts that will sustain a balanced budget over time. Let's work together, unlock our creativity, put these $120 million of property tax relief into the highest and best use. We're also making a difference with our investments in safe and healthy communities. We're on track to advance all of the recommendations from our historic three-branch behavioral health council. And this year, my Idaho First Plan does even more to improve resources for troubled youth and mental health crises. It also, we're going to make long-term investments in behavioral health services more accessible to our neediest neighbors and add more doctors for rural Idaho and more healthcare workers overall. And my Idaho First Plan backs the blue again, adding a 10% pay raise for our brave and dedicated law enforcement officers. What does this mean to your average state trooper? It means a $6,000 raise. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, while other places seek to defund the police, the police here in Idaho, we defend the police. Our men and women in law enforcement work tirelessly to help keep us safe, many times confronting the most heinous side of humanity. This past fall, four young lives were ended in one of the worst crimes in our state and our nation, our nation have ever seen. Ethan, Kaylee, Zanna, and Maddie were brutally murdered in a home near the University of Idaho campus. The loss of these incredible people is felt exponentially and we will never forget them. Amen. We will vigorously seek justice for the victims and the many loved ones they leave behind. I ask everyone now to please pause for a moment of silence and prayer for them. Thank you. Our law enforcement heroes handle this loss with professionalism and they routinely encounter dangerous and difficult situation to keep us safe, especially when it comes to fentanyl. We are losing more and more young lives to the most potent and deadliest drug our society has faced, fentanyl. It's 50 times more potent than heroin, 100 times more potent than morphine, and hard to detect. Fentanyl is now the leading cause of death for American adults under age 50. Michael Stabell, a 15-year-old from Coeur d'Alene, was another young Idahoan with a bright future whose promising life was cut short. Michael tragedy, tragically lost his life when he took a pill he thought was a pain reliever, but came from an unknown known source. The pill contained a lethal trace of fentanyl, as small as a grain of salt, killing him almost instantly. Michael's mom and dad Jennifer and Frank are here with us today. <laughs> Jennifer and Frank, we're so sorry for your loss and thank you for being here. They described their only child as their miracle baby and a boy who loved the outdoors and his family dearly. We are now taking steps to protect our youth from fentanyl. All of these steps grew out of our Operation Esto Perpetua initiative last year. To root out this growing problem, I call for the development of a new statewide interdiction team at the Idaho State Police. In addition, enhanced testing and training and a new educational awareness campaign we just launched will help. Our campaign is called All It Takes, and it launched last week at fentanyltakesall.org. It will feature Michael's story and the stories of many other young Idahoans who have lost their lives to accidental fentanyl poisoning. 
We aim to inf inform our youth about the dangers of fentanyl, its accessibility, its potency, and its ability to take everything from you and your loved ones, as it did with the Stabils. I have seen for myself how the Mexican drug cartels control the access into our country under the current administration. The vast majority of illicit drugs in Idaho, including fentanyl, are sourced in Mexico. We will not relent in our efforts to end the supply of fentanyl by continuing to work with our states to the south and helping to secure our border. In 2021, the state of Arizona called for support in controlling the chaos at the border. I sent a team of drug interdiction specialists with ISP to help. I'm pleased to announce that I'm sending a team back to the border. They will hone their skills and return with even better knowledge to train police in our state on the best ways to get fentanyl off our street. <laughs> Colonel Ked Wills and a few of our state police are here with us today, including Sergeant Darren Gilbertson, Sergeant Cotterell, Chris Cotterell, Trooper Mitch Howard, can you gentlemen please stand? <laughs> Our law enforcement, active military, and veterans all deserve our gratitude for their service and commitment. Thank you. It's easy to be cynical about government when you see what hap what's happening in Washington, D.C. and other dysfunctional states around the country. But it's also easy to be inspired by the real difference we are making in Idaho when we put Idaho first. Focusing on schools, tax relief, safe communities, strategic investments, and good government. Folks, after years of being around the political process, I have learned that politics can complicate otherwise pretty simple concepts. There's nothing complicated about our state's success. There's nothing complicated about how to keep our success going. Idaho first. Listen to the people. Stay on course. Keep the big picture in focus and don't lose our direction. Concentrate on what matters way beyond our time here. Double down on our support for schools and tax relief and continue key investments to keep up with growth and make our communities safe. It's that simple. I know you're motivated to get things done and I am too. I'm grateful for our partnership. We will put our trust in God and together we will get our work done efficiently and transparently, apparently focusing on things that matter. The people of Idaho expect us to work together and working together has always been the only way to get historic things done. Thank you and God bless. That was Governor Brad Little's 2023 State of the State Address to the Joint Idaho Legislature. Joining me on set is Kevin Richard of Idaho Education News, Alex Adams, Chief of the Division of Financial Management, and Dr. Stephanie Witt from Boise State University School of Public Service. Kevin, I wanna start with you. Um, huge emphasis on education. It was almost the first half of his speech. Yeah, it was It was definitely the theme of this, uh, of this speech and, and what we expected, because what we talked about at the open was we came into this with a $410 million question. What was the governor going to propose to do with the money that was allocated in that special session? He laid out a pretty detailed plan focusing on teacher pay, teacher pay raises, and on uh, scholarships for, for college-bound students or, or high school graduates, wherever they choose to go. Wait, and let, let's talk a little bit um, about that emphasis and that commitment to public schools before we get into some of the details. Alex, uh, a, a, as we know, going into the session, there's a lot of conversation already about potential school choice bills that we might see um, from both new and uh, some of the more experienced lawmakers. Governor Little outlined all of the ways that Idaho has so many forms of school choice. Um, I, emphasized a huge appreciation for public school teachers and employees. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that tone and that intent there? 
Well, so Governor Little talked about the constitutional and the moral obligation that we have to fund public schools. And what he's saying is that he's fulfilling that obligation as well as delivering on the promise of the special session by putting $360 million ongoing to public schools. As Kevin said, that's getting starting teacher pay up to top 10 in the country. It's fully closing the classified staff gap. That's pay for bus drivers and lunchroom workers and janitors and that support staff that makes our schools run. He's also uh, doing the largest infusion of discretionary dollars into public schools in state history. Why? To give local schools local control and allow them to meet the needs that are most pressing in their local school district. Now the governor did make a successful program empowering parents an ongoing program. That's a program that uh, provides money to families so that parents are in charge of their children's education, whether it be using those dollars for tutoring, for unique classes, for technology, or things like that. Uh, but the governor's fulfilling the promise of the special session as well as the state's constitutional obligation to public schools. And Kevin, I, about the Empowering Parents grant, grant, how does that differ from some of the, say, education savings account um, proposals that we're going to hear this session? Well, that's going to be the interesting this thing to see how that unfolds, because right now Empowering Parents is not an education savings account legislation. I mean, parents can use that money for for computer equipment, they can use it for curriculum, they can use it for counseling, they can use it for a lot of different things. They can't put that money right now into uh, private school tuition. And that may be a, an interesting part of this debate. I mean, a couple of years ago, there was a similar bill uh, that was designed to try to extend a version of what is now empowering parents that did have a component that would have allowed education savings account or scholarship type of program. That didn't get through the legislature. This is a little bit different legislature. So that, I think, is going to be the education debate of the session. And something I'm sure that we will revisit so many times over the next I suspect so. <laughs> three or four months. We'll see. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the um, uh, Governor Little addressed pay for public school employees, not just teachers. The average teacher will get, under his plan, a $6,300 raise, but also for classified staff. We're talking um, school cooks, we're you know, cafeteria workers, secretaries, bus drivers, janitors. Why was that on his radar? So it's, it's been a topic of conversation for years, and it culminated in December with a report from OPE, the Office of the Performance Evaluations for the Legislature. And they quantified there's a $97 million gap between what we currently pay classified staff and what school districts pay classified staff. So by fully closing that gap, you're putting more money back into the pocket of public school districts to use for increasing pay, increasing benefits for insurance, or addressing other local needs. But uh, certainly, again, I, as I said earlier, those classified staff is what makes a school tick. It's what makes it work. And you'll find every teacher tell you how important their classified staff is uh, to improving the lives of, of the students in their uh, school. And uh, when the OPE report came out, they quantified the gap in both salary and employer obligation benefits. The governor's budgeted to fully cover that gap. Well, and we heard from so many districts around the state how fortunate Idaho was that more schools didn't close down because of a shortage of classified staff, especially during the height of the pandemic. Um, I, I, I wanna touch on um, funding, discretionary funding for schools. There's $52.4 million discretionary funding for schools. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, as I said, it's the largest infusion of discretionary dollars in the public schools budget in state history. And why that was important is I don't know that uh, the governor thinks that uh, in Boise you can make decisions for every school district throughout the state. What's needed at one might be different than what's needed at others. So it gives schools the latitude to use it for facilities, for uh, extracurricular activities, for health insurance, for additional pay for classified staff beyond what we already talked about. He trusts those local schools to make the decisions that are in the best interest for their district and it's giving them the flexibility to address local needs. But I think it'll be interesting to see how that's received by school officials as to how they would use that money and how much they trust that that money is going to be there down the road. I mean, if you put money uh, into salaries or benefits, you want that to be a, an ongoing source of funding. And Dr. Wood, I want to bring you into the conversation. There's a tie-in here, too, with this ongoing effort, both on the state level and local level, to reduce property taxes, because there are so many districts that do rely on local, local property tax funds to help with 
those those building needs and the mm -hmm. infrastructure needs within their school district um, might this help in a in kind of a holistic way reduce some of those property taxes I would think so um, you know one of the ways that we do things here in Idaho is that the total cost of capital construction for school buildings is borne by local taxpayers, usually through general obligation bonds that are very hard to pass because of our 66 and two-thirds approval threshold. So the discretionary money we're talking about here may help some districts who have been frozen out of bonds, bonds by having a majority say yes, but not quite 66 and two-thirds percent. So you could see a shifting of some, um, some of those kinds of building costs onto this discretionary funds. It, I think what you're pointing out is really important. This isn't $52 million forever. This is a, a, a giant, but one time infusion of money probably. And so uh, that would lead me to pick one time big lumpy costs like capital expenditures. And so we may see a bias towards that kind of spending as opposed to um, uh, increasing teacher pay or something that has an ongoing fiscal impact on the district. One thing just to clarify, all the governor's recommendations that we've talked about for education, including the discretionary, is is ongoing. So that would be a permanent and ongoing source of appropriations for them. The $330 million that was set aside for public schools as part of the special session comes right off of the sales tax annually. There's not a growth factor applied to it, but that $330 million is an annual appropriation. This is how the governor's choosing to divide the pie. Well, that, that's, that's good news, I would think, for districts who, who can make maybe personnel commitments that they wouldn't otherwise. They may be able to use this money, too, to pay down existing special levies, existing bonds that are outstanding. And, and if the legislature signs on to the idea of $52.4 million in discretionary funding ongoing, that's a more stable funding source than the supplemental levies that 90-some school districts are using across the state right. that have to be approved by voters every one or two years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and, and that, that touches on um, one of the themes that we've heard throughout not just Governor Little's speech, but also from lawmakers, this cautionary tale, uh, direct quote from Governor Little's speech uh, from Lieutenant Governor Bedke's grandfather, it won't be the bad years that put you out of business, it's what you do in the good years that set you up for failure or success. So understanding that we have unprecedented growth in Idaho's population and unprecedented needs um, with, with that infrastructure that's associated with growth, how much did that play into Governor Little's crafting of the budget proposal? Quite a bit. So if you look under Governor Little's leadership, we've moved up in every national ranking on fiscal policy, uh, tax policy, reserve fund policy, and for the first time in state history, we get upgraded in our credit rating from AA to AAA. And that's because Governor Little is focused on all those back end things that perhaps don't grab headlines, but make for good fiscal policy. This budget maxes out our rainy day funds to the statutory maximum. It pays off callable debt. It uh, pays off a large fraction of the deferred maintenance backlog to lower our out year's costs. We don't know what's on the near horizon for the economy, but we all see those dark storm clouds gathering. And you can have confidence that Idaho will weather that storm better than most, if not any other state, because of the decisions Governor Little has made and the legislature has implemented in the last uh, few years. A lot of what we've done is treat the one-time surplus as that, one time in nature, and used it to parlay into infrastructure investments. In fact, the governor's budget has more than a billion dollars in infrastructure investments where it matters. Water, uh, airports, roads, bridges. Mm -hmm. We had a backlog of uh, $600 million worth of bridges that are either structurally poor, deficient, or predated the Nixon administration. <laughs> yeah, the governor's budget clears out a third of that backlog and will improve bridges throughout the state. Well, I was pretty sure I was the only thing that predated the Nixon <laughs> administration <laughs> here, but uh, the <laughs> I think this is a, a, a super kind of investment in infrastructure, those costs. The longer we defer them, the bigger they get. So um, this second year of enormous progress on roads and bridges and catching up is, is I think, terrific news not just uh, for the governor, but for the local governments throughout the state that um, administer the maintenance on those bridges. And once again, there's a tie into the property taxes here too. There's, there's the potential for taking care of the backlog and also new um, infrastructure mm -hmm. growth that we need to 
address You're in the state. You're shifting them off of the property tax. Yeah. yeah. And I was struck by the governor's tone on the property tax debate. We know there's going to be a big debate over how to address property tax relief. We know it's an incredibly complicated issue. The message that I heard from the governor today was uh, to legislators, this may be your one shot. With the economy going in whatever direction it seems to be going, we may not be able to do this again in 2024, 2025. You've got one shot at trying to address property tax relief. That's a that's a really really good point. I, I want to talk a little bit too about the the tone of the speech overall. You know, on on Friday we heard his inauguration speech, which was I think full of gratitude. Um, you know, and and uh, acknowledging what a difficult past four years, especially three years that we've seen because of the pandemic. This speech was a lot more confident. It was loose. It had a lot of jokes in there. Um, it and and I think that. That was pretty telling to me, Alex. You see a governor that is committed to the state of Idaho and keeping Idaho first. And the line that really sticks out to me is when the governor talks about what we do here is more important than any of us and the work we do will outlive all of us. I think he's seen that sense of legacy and what he wants to leave behind. And I think this budget is a big part of that. Largest education investment in state history, over a billion dollars of infrastructure investments that will have ripple benefits for our children and grandchildren. $120 million in property tax relief while leaving a structurally balanced budget and something uh, that will endure any economic headwinds, I, I, I think is uh, something he's pretty proud of and uh, something that will lead to a lot of good for a lot of Idahoans. You also heard the tone of a governor who just got reelected fairly handily. He didn't talk about the vote margins in his own races, the primary or the general election. He talked a lot about the margin uh, of victory on the advisory question, but uh, it was definitely the tone of a governor who is, you know, feeling, feeling pretty well mandated by the people to pursue his path. Mm -hmm. I, that said, there, there's the people of Idaho and then there's the legislature. And we know that this is, you know, the, the largest freshman class that we've seen in Idaho in decades. We also have a new leadership team in the House with a speaker who in the past has butted heads with local governments. Uh, Dr. Witt, I'd, I'd love to get your take on that dynamic and what Governor Little's proposal, what hurdles it might come across. Well, <laughs> uh, the legislature and local governments have had a rough time in the last several terms, so I'm, I'm curious to see how this goes. Now, I see several things in this speech and the governor's priorities that are actually very friendly towards local governments. So if the legislature enacts what he's proposing, then I think they have, they have several things to be very happy about in terms of financial assistance that, that wasn't there before. Um, there are probably still things that the local governments would like to see that probably have no chance in the legislature, like a local option taxation authority. I mean, that predates my arrival in Idaho, you know, that, that they've been asking for that. It's usually dead on arrival or it's available, but in such a way nobody would ever want it or use it. So there are some issues like that that will continue. And uh, we were talking before the uh, speech began that there are some new members of the legislature who have experience in local government. They were on city councils, they were county commissioners, they were school district uh, trustees. So I expect the, uh, maybe the empathy of the legislature to be a little higher for the issues that are on local government's agendas. There's that class, but then there's Speaker Mike Moyle, who, you know, when we heard him on Thursday during the Idaho Press Club legislative preview, you know, his big message for local governments was, you've got to control your spending, you've got to cut your budgets if we want to cut these property taxes very different, um, I guess, point of view than what a lot of those local government officials have when it comes to growth paying for itself. Well, so they probably would like to see some action on impact fees and other ways to capture uh, new people paying more of their share of growth. I, I think that um, property tax, t really simplistically, you've got the tax rate, the evaluation, and the amount of your budget that comes from the property tax if you're a local government, right? Homeowners are fixated on that valuation phase. My, my house is worth you know, three, five times what it was when I bought it. The, uh, my homeowner's exemption is still the same, so the amount that I'm exposed to for taxation is, is a lot bigger. 
Uh, that's what worries homeowners. Speaker Moyle likes to focus on the percentage of the city's budget that comes from property taxes. I just see them not communicating. And I just, I mean, there's quite a bit of an excitement to work with a new legislature, new leadership, and I think the conversations have gone really well so far. You know, I think the one new proposal that the governor put forward that I, I think is worth talking about is what he's proposing for the Idaho launch program. And uh, he's proposing, starting with the class of 2024, uh, $8,500 scholarships for graduating students to use uh, for uh, the in-demand career of their choice. They could use it at a college, a community college, a workforce training provider, a career technical provider. They could use it at the lineman college, et cetera. So there's uh, certainly quite a bit of excitement about that proposal and the ability to work with the new legislature to bring things like that across the finish line. And on that relationship with the legislature and, and speaking of the speaker, I, I was struck by something that he said on Thursday during the uh, legislative previews. He said that to his liking, to his tastes, he feels like maybe the spending over the past couple of years has maybe been a little bit too aggressive. Taking the $410 million for education out of the equation because, you know, the, the governor can certainly argue that that's baked in, that that's been approved, that that's been earmarked. I wonder how that message from the speaker, how that reflects maybe the mindset of some legislators about budgets in general and spending in general and, and how they'll approach uh, the overall uh, little budget proposal. We only have a few minutes left. I do want to touch on the public safety aspect of Governor Little's budget proposal. A 10% salary boost for state law enforcement officials, um, average state police trooper would see a $6,000 annual raise with that proposal. Um, also, more money for drug testing and fentanyl trading. We heard the devastating story of the um, teenager in Coeur d'Alene who passed away from, a, from a trace amounts of fentanyl in yeah. a pill that he took. Um, talk to us a little bit more about those priorities. Also, as the governor said, we're a state that defends the police while others seek to defund it. So uh, in the first point that you may mention, the 10% raise, that's for all law enforcement officials in state government. So that's inclusive of state police, as well as Department of Corrections and Department of Juvenile Correction staffers who are categorized as law enforcement. And have also seen employment shortages. Absolutely, they have. And uh, there's quite a bit of pressure uh, in competing with counties and city governments throughout the state. Uh, so this allows us to keep those law enforcement heroes on the state payroll and keeping our community safe as we saw up in Moscow and elsewhere. Um, in terms of the other priorities, the governor really hit on uh, addressing the fentanyl issue. He had two work streams. He had the Behavioral Health Council and the Operation Esto Perpetua Task Force. Combined, you'll see over $100 million in recommendations uh, to address the fentanyl crisis as well as the behavioral health crisis uh, throughout the state. Specifically to fentanyl, he announced the creation of a statewide uh, drug interdiction uh, task force to help keep these drugs off the streets and out of the hands of uh, children like the uh, gentleman that was uh, recognized as part of the speech. Uh, there's going to be more public communications campaign as well as enhanced testing uh, uh, throughout the state uh, police. And then on the behavioral health side, you'll see uh, record investments in facilities, uh, inpatient capacity to treat more individuals in Idaho, including uh, inpatient youth uh, treatment. We have about half a minute left, but it seems there's not just the emphasis on the public safety and the punishment side, but also on the prevention, prevention. side and the treatment side. Absolutely, it, a key priority for the governor. And, and a, a shifting, I guess, uh, philosophical uh, yeah. view. Looking upstream is uh, always a better outcome than looking downstream. Fantastic. Well, we're gonna leave it there. Alex Adams, Chief of the Division of Financial Management, Dr. Stephanie Witt from Boise State University School of Public Service, and Kevin Richard of Idaho Education News. We will have so much more on this Friday's show. And as always, we'll have much more online throughout the week. You can find all of our online content at idahoptv.org slash Idaho Reports.